Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the short but memorable Springbok career of Mornay Fisser. Mornay, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you, Peter. Nice to be with you. Now, before we get started, let's take a look at this week's trivia question. In 2019, who became the first Springbok to score a try in a Rugby World Cup final? Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. And we'll also find out if Mornay knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Mornay, I would like to go back to 1994. I think it's fair to say that you were in outstanding form for Western Province in the Curry Cup, but you were overlooked for Springbok selection. How disappointing was that for you? Yeah, Peter, good question. Um, take me right back to the action back then. 94, we had a very good year, you're right. Um, I just came onto the scene. I think 92, 93, I had a couple of um, guys coming from the bench back then. But 94 was really an outstanding season for me. Yeah, I mean, you're always disappointed. Um, you always want to play for the Springbok. So I can remember now, without preparing for this conversation, I can re remember well the disappointment back then. Um, we were highly competitive. Um, obviously, back then, the Transvaal... The Lions team was very, very strong um, and and the rivalry was quite fierce. So yeah, back then, quite disappointed. But also then, probably you're going to ask later, you know, you had your interaction with the various um, coaches. So you sort of knew where you where you stand with them and, and where you need to up your game or not. Mona, I can remember conversations with my dad and my uncles at the time. And obviously, you know, I didn't tell you this before we began, but I'm from Cape Town. And obviously, my uncles and my father, you know, we grew up there. And, and that's where we were from, supporting Western Province. And the kind of conversations that you would hear uh, at a braai would always be things like, Mornay Fissa should be in the Springbok team. Why isn't Mornay Fissa in the Springbok squad at least? I'm sure that you would have heard conversations like that as well, given the good form that you were in. How difficult difficult can it be when, you know, obviously people mean well and they're being supportive, but obviously from your point of view, you've already missed out a little bit. Yeah, look, obviously your father knows his rap, yeah. <laughs> no, but thinking back now, I don't think so. I think um, without limiting myself, I think I had a lot of competition back then. I think um, um, James Dalton was really firing back then. Um, Naka Drost. Roski just started playing hooker. He was he was a very good player. Um, Andres Triscott was in and out in the sense of from a, from an injury perspective, he was good. John Allen was there. He had a very good track record, um, and he performed well. Um, there was a couple of other names too, but I mean the competition was there, so it was touch and go. On on the day, you probably could have. Um, choose any one of us and I think we would have performed the way we did and then as you know rugby is subjective and also secondly to that it's a, it's a team sport so if you play in a team that's performing well it's just so much easier as a unit as a front row um, to perform um, better or to perceive to be better than than the, the person you are competing with and I think in that sense James not that James was standing back to any one of us but definitely helped him to come from that back then Transvaal pack um, that we competed with. And then you did get your opportunity against Western Samoa, as they were still called, uh, in April 1995 at Ellis Park. Talk to me about how you were feeling and how you remember the moment when you were called up. It, 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 it was a big surprise and obviously the happiness um, was there and everybody was supportive and all that. But also, if, if you take a step back, that was in 95, and I think, you must correct me, Kids Christie took over, when was it, 94, middle 94. Um, and then we had training camps. So every Monday, you would fly up after playing any one of the teams on a Saturday. The Monday, you would fly up um, from Cape Town or wherever you are based, and then you would have a full day with uh, Kids Christie and his Casey Pinar and Henny Becker and Monet Duplessis um, and Ray Mort. They, um, that was his support team back then. And you had sessions with them. So you build it up this, this team or group. So you're always there pushing. Um, I played South Africa A against um, Argentina, against Australia, um, a team. So you're always there in the mix. So you're always waiting uh, for that opportunity. 
And I think Blit, um, Dalton got injured. And then, and then obviously, I, I was disappointed then because Chris, sorry, Chris Rousseau was also there. And Chris Rousseau and, and um, um, Dalton was competing in the same spot in the, in the Transvaal team. But he also came from Eitzman, and obviously, um, um, history will prove that Chris Bray was became a very good hooker. But back then, you know, he was he was there and about. So obviously, now I know after my conversations with Keith Christie and Monet Dubussy, I understand the reason why he didn't push me hard back then, um, which we can, which we can discuss. But yeah, and Bullet got injured, and then Chris. Um, um, got 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 the spot, and then I got onto the bench and all that. There, there I realized that, you know, maybe my shortcomings, in a sense, um, was just of such a nature that it's going to be a very difficult for me to make to make the Springbok side. And the conversation was always about, and I mean, I had this conversation with Kids Christie when you had the one on ones with him, and he just, I mean, he was really re respectful. We had a great relationship in the sense he was honest. And he really, the conversation was always about how he appreciated um, how I play and how he rate me as a player. But his words was always the same. He said, Mornay, five he used to use this analogy. He said, five, five yards from the from your own goal line, it's a scrum against the All Blacks. You are too small. You are too too light. So that was always the conversation that he, he felt I was too small back then. And probably he was. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that was that was always the the sort of the limitation that was was put on my head of being too small, too light for the big games to to, to scrum there. At least he was honest, and I'm sure that you appreciated that. Um, but just again, focusing on that test match against Western Samoa. So you were on the bench, and we know that in those days, if you were on the bench, you only got to come on if someone was injured. Nevertheless, how excited were you? Yeah, very excited. I actually came on as, um, I mean, obviously, the Springboks won that game quite far and easily, but the last 30 minutes, 20 minutes, the guys were dropping like flies. And, and at one stage, I could see, well, there's no one left here. Yeah, and Ollie was sitting next to me. And Ollie wanted, I said, No, Ollie, I'm going on now. Probably not like that, but I had a feeling if I need to make space now, I need to get on now. And then at the end, I think Chris went to to to, to flank and I Chris was so and I went to hook and yeah, it, it was a great feeling to to to, to obviously run up there getting your Springbok um, colors. And obviously then you have that um, moment or thought where it's, you know, all the hard work and all the sacrifices and, and all that, and that just becomes real. So that was, that was, that was a great moment for me. Um, like you said, probably too short, but I mean, it's like reaching the summit, take a quick picture and then you go down. And no one can take it away from you. Uh, that is a fact. Yeah. I've got to ask you, Mornay, uh, I've had a couple of former Springboks on this show who also made their debuts off the bench. And uh, they told me that subsequently when they started for the Springboks for the first time, that that was when they only felt that they were truly Springboks. Now, obviously, you didn't get that opportunity. I'm just wondering if you would agree with that, that maybe you feel that you missed out on something or doesn't it really matter? Um, it doesn't really matter to me, but you are true. I would imagine that. And you can ask some of my close friends. I don't see myself technically as a Springbok, or maybe that's not the right description, but I don't see myself as a Springbok. Yes, I represented the Springboks from the bench, but I think you're right. Um, you can't walk around and say, I'm a Springbok rugby player if you made your debut against the, from the bench and you haven't really started. That doesn't really matter, but I don't, I've never, I've never ever seen, I've got my Springbok blazer i don't know where it is i haven't looked at it you know so but that's my personality so so it, i don't carry that those bags with me but um sometimes you you're happy that you had that glimpse of of, of recognition um where time and position came together and you could put that uh, great jersey over your your head but i mean being a springbok and not a springbok yeah you're probably right you know maybe I can say I'm not a Springbok because <laughs> I haven't started, but I think it would be totally different. Um, I can imagine starting a, a test match than just coming up from the from the bench. Obviously, it would have been great to start at least one test match. I think, yeah, I think there's a difference between the two. Um, but that's that's for another day's discussion. 
But again, no one can take it away from you. You were on the field as a Springbok. Mona, I want to ask you this, right? So millions of kids grow up in South Africa dreaming of becoming a Springbok. And many of them, I think, think that they are going to play for five years, 10 years. They're going to play 50 tests, 100 tests. But maybe it might only be five minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes or whatever the case may be, or one match. What is your advice to those kids? Yeah, I think that's relevant. Um, that's not really relevant if you make it to become a springboard. I think I'm old enough now and yourself to know you just need to be a good person, you know. And what, and how do you know you're successful if you're a better person today than what you was yesterday? So you, making becoming a springboard or not doesn't make you successful in life. Doesn't make you um, doesn't define you as a human being. If you, it, it's about if you've got all the talent to be a springboard, to be whatever you like, to be a hundred test springbok and you don't make it through laziness or or the fact that you you don't want to do sacrifices yeah i mean laziness comes up a lot in these conversations and you know then then you then you should say look i didn't fulfill my potential and all that um i think someone that's got all that and i've seen so many of those those people that's got all the talent much faster much stronger you know than yourselves but just don't have that um, self-discipline to work. I think that is when you can become negative or criticize a person, all that. But sometimes, you know, someone was dealt the cards through physicality, through his speed, his power, um, and his body bolt um, to not play for the Springbok, but he ended up making one, one test. Maybe his achievement in, um, in relative terms is much better than the person that played two test matches and should have played 20 or 30 but i mean it's a it's a it's a difficult conversation but i think for any young person you know you got to work hard um nothing comes easy um doesn't need to be rugby it can be any sport it can be even your job it can be your studies and the consistency thereof the self-discipline and making sure you're becoming a better person um for all aspects of of, of life i think that should be the goal, um, and not so much being a spremography player. If you can be a spremography player, I just think it's a great added bonus that you can put to your CV, and of which you can leverage off wherever you want to go off that, because we all know you should live, if you look at the stats, 30 to 40 years after you've finished your, your career in rugby. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not consider becoming a patron? It's my dream, guys, to do this full time, and with a small financial contribution, you can help me realize that dream. The link and the QR code is appearing on your screen right now, and I'll also put it down in the description area for you to go and click on at a later stage if you would like to do so. And by becoming a patron, I promise there will be great benefits for members. Now let's get back to the interview. Mona, you mentioned that you were part of the training camps with Kitch Christie and the coaching staff and flying up and, and, and all of that. I must ask you, because it's difficult to find information on this stuff online, especially because it was, let's be honest, uh, quite a while ago. Uh, were you part of the pre-Rugby World Cup training camps? Yes, yes. So, so those were the camps where we flew up every Monday and all that. And that, that's where we dealt with kids. That was back then. Also the Transvaal coats. And they, I mean... He wasn't my coach. I wasn't as close to him as the Transvaal people, but I did experience him and I had a, as a squad member, I had conversations with him, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, but, and there I could sense and feel and experience that, that, that he was a remarkable person, you know, and, and it's no surprise that he won the World Cup, you know, given his personality and his value system and, and his relationship and his belief in, what he wants to achieve. But I mean, even that, I mean, like I said, I don't know him as well as Pinar Pinar or Kubis Visa and those people were because you could see those relationships was extremely strong. But I mean, even himself, I, don't, I mean, I've looked into it. I mean, Primo Grugby also came right at the end, at the pinnacle of his career. He spent years and years at Club Rugby, cold evenings in Pretoria and Johannesburg and eventually... You know, he, he got this, this job through circumstances and look how well he did, you know. But he was there for 30 years in club rugby and then, you know, eventually he, he got that opportunity and why did he took out of it? But I mean, looking back now, 
I, I can clearly see why he was successful. Sadly, um, you know, we lost him through illness and all that. But I mean, yeah, that that was quite a special experience, just those limited um, interactions with him. And then how I can relate that to the success of the 95 team in the World Cup. There's something else I want to ask you about those training camps, Mornay, because I had Joel Stransky on this show a few months ago, and he described those training sessions, especially the fitness side of things, as torture. What would you say? Yes, they were. Um, I dropped out of those training camps a month before the World Cup because I had an injury. Just after the Simone game, I, I injured my neck. Um, and but there I, I know from obviously speaking and, and um, to your to your co-teammates, it went up two, three, four levels. But even when I was involved, um, you know, fitness was was absolute at, the, at, at a different level. And it's quite interesting without sports science. So, you know, it was those old fitness um, drills and all that. But that team was really fit or well, that squad was extremely fit. How how science was part of it, I don't always know, or but I mean, back then you could get away with that. So I've got to ask you then, Mornay, uh, given that you had that neck injury, as you mentioned, when James Dalton was sent off against Canada and Kitch Christie needed a replacement hooker, would you have been in contention for that, or were you still injured? No, I was still injured, but I, I, I smile because I, I, I mean, and he's a great person, so I don't, I'm not being negative, but I, I read um, John Allen's book, or I just read some of the pages standing there at the airport, you know, reading it. But John, John should have been there, and, and I can't remember that. But he's claiming that spot and and how he pulled his his his, his um, I think his calf muscle, all that. But there's a lot of people that claim that. Obviously, I, I will never claim. I was there in the mix, but I was injured then. I got injured about a month before that, four weeks. But I can write a book or try and write a book and say yeah, I should have been there. But that's not that's not important, John is saying he should have been there. The other day, Naka was there, you know, and, and Naka did well. Um, he did no less um, better than anyone else would have done, but, I mean, he, he got the call up. So I can't say that. I would love to think that, Peter. But, I mean, like I said, I don't, my thoughts don't go that way. No, for sure. As it turns out, I've had both of those men on this show uh, previously, Naka Drotsky, uh, who was kind enough to come here and talk about his experiences. I think the TV cameras were probably most famously caught him on the bench cheering on the team uh, in the final. And then, as you say, John Allen, uh, he shared that story as well here. Uh, he was playing club rugby uh, the night before he was supposed to fly up uh, to the Springboks, and he uh, was kind enough to share that story with us. Mornay, let me ask you, who was your toughest opponent? The toughest opponent was the guy that you didn't mentally prepare for in a club match somewhere at Villages, Durbanville, or wherever. You, yeah, it, it was the guy you were not mentally prepared for, and he decided that day that he wants to play against you today 100% combat. You know, that, that was the toughest. Um, I was, and I've, people ask me this question a lot over the years who's the toughest? And all. Remember, when you go in the field, you're fearless. You don't fear anyone. I mean, there's no fear in any rugby player, I would imagine, let alone a Springbok or a provincial player. I mean, it's just, it's just not part of your DNA. So you fear no one. So now I can't say. Different, different stages. When I was really making my debut, I could feel I wasn't strong enough or, you know, because I was still too young. Um, and playing against Free State or Warren Transvaal, you could really feel the other person being stronger. But then, you know, that's just because you're just playing too young to play in that circumstances. But then you work on that. So so that's different, you know. Um, and then five years later, you don't you don't feel that pressure and all that. But to give you a better answer, um, I would say the best front row I played against was probably um, Super 10. We played against Auckland. It was Craig Dowd, uh, Fitzpatrick and Olo Brown. And then you can go on the rest of the All Black pack was there. Because remember, if you've got that such a long memory, back then I was the smallest hooker, but I mean, we were really a strong pack. And, and that killed Uli Smith. And, and, and the, you know, they were not happy because we, I had, um, um, what's it, um, Tommy Loebscher and Gary Pagel, Keith Angus and Tox van der Linde. They, they, I mean, they were big 
big men back then, and obviously it was quite comfortable on them. So we were quite not dominant, but we were holding ourselves towards dominance when we played against South African packs um, back then. But then we played against that um, pack in 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 Auckland, and I mean that that they they just they did whatever they wanted to us. They they said to each other, let's take them left, they take us left. Let's they take us right, they take us right. Let's go up, they take us up. I mean, uh, it's not a nice feeling, but after that game, we were smiling at each other because, I mean, we got played with, you know, as men or, or, or whatever. They really played with us that day. But, I mean, they were smaller than us. So that, that was pure technique, and it was, it was working together, cohesion and alignment. Um, you don't need to be bigger, so it's just it was just pure, better, better um, alignment from eight people versus the other eight people. Is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us? Oh, many funny moments. No, it was always funny moments. The one funny moment was back then. Also, um, we played one night against Northern Free State in Valcom on a Friday night, and I was cocky and, and, and all that and they warned me and the long story short um, the lock hit um, hit me so hard so, I, so he knocked me out and instead of going the same direction I fell this way from the side he was hitting me and I tore my, my, my ligaments in my ankle falling over and I was right out so that was quite severe and they, they took me off the field, but I obviously deserved it because I was looking for it and they just were fed up with me. But so, so you know, I worked up there and the lady said, don't worry, this is where you are and all that. But the next day, my I lived in the decks in Stellenbosch. My friends were arriving there, they couldn't stop laughing and, and, and they were crying, laughing for the fact that I got a hiding and all that. So that that will always stick to me, you know, the severity of me being sad. I've just torn my ligaments. I can't play for another month or whatever. And they were just crapping themselves the fact that I got beaten up, probably deserve it, you know, back then. So, yeah, that was quite funny and always stick to my mind. Very cool. Tell me, Mornay, uh, when you look around today, is there a current player that you admire? Yeah, all of them. I mean, all of them. Um, but obviously, you always look at your position. So, I mean, Marx is... I mean, he is phenomenal. I thought about the other day, I don't know if it was a good thing or bad thing that, that, that he left the swim box because obviously Paul came in. But I think that was when when Marx got injured now. that I haven't seen him in such a good shape. You could just see he was ready for the World Cup. So obviously, you know, I admire his his strength and his ability to, to, to compete for the ball and being an extra um, um, loose forward. But then also, you know, I've learned you 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 gotta you gotta honor people like Bongi too because he he fulfills a different role, you know. And then whoever, you know. So you now being being an ex hooker, you always keep an eye on the youngsters and all the current people and see what you would have done or could have done and how you would have, you know, played in that position. But I would say obviously Marx is is, is world class, and then Bongi you can see is extremely strong and puts a lot of effort in his scrummaging. Um, and making sure that um, he takes charge of the pack. And what are you up to these days? No, oh, I remember back then we just started working, but we're also professionals and, and that worked out well. So I've always been in investment banking and from invest after rugby and then after investment banking, I went into asset management. And today I'm a portfolio manager working for one of the larger um, asset managers in South Africa. Yeah, so... Sometimes boring, but yeah, I enjoy it, and I've been in that industry since I since I since I finished my rugby career. Not boring at all, Mone, because you know what, uh, and and you'll remember uh, Johan Roo from your playing days, a uh, similar sort of uh, working background, and I had him on the show <laughs> a couple of months ago, and uh, I asked him this, and I'm going to ask you now the same thing. From an investment point of view, I'm a big fan of looking at S and P 500 ETFs. Am I on the right track? Yeah, you're buying an index. That's what it is. Dollar, dollar dominated. So you've got hard currency exposure. There's obviously a thousand other things you can buy. But I mean, um, it's a pure hedge against your dollar, your rent. But if you live in South Africa, so I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a calm bet. It's a good bet. But I mean, you know, 
in our industry, one must be careful to comment or to provide advice on, on investments. It's such an emotional, um, it can become such an emotional um, topic and, and experience. So, yeah, one needs to be careful saying buy this and don't buy that and, and you should have bought this because hindsight in, in our world also remember hindsight is a perfect science, you know. Um, if, if I know, if I know tomorrow's paper today, I, I'll be a billionaire. Absolutely. I'm still sitting here thinking I should have bought Tesla four years ago, but here we, <laughs> here we are. That's, that's, the, that's the hindsight, you know. Exactly. It, it will kill, it will kill you. <laughs> All right, Mona, we're going to finish off by looking again at that trivia question. In 2019, who became the first Springbok to score a try in a Rugby World Cup final? Do you know the answer, Mone? Is that not my pimpy? It is my pimpy, exactly. Makazole my pimpy, the first Springbok to score a try for South Africa in a Rugby World Cup final. And then about 10 minutes later, Cheslin Colby became the second yeah. of very yeah. fond memories. Uh, Mone, let me say it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure. And I really hope we can have you on again in the future. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice speaking to you. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had former Springbok prop Richard Bands on the show. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, 1995 Rugby World Cup champion Gary Pagel will be my guest.